right? We have read, and you've heard me say a few times already that Christmas is pretty special. There are so many reasons Christmas can be great. I wonder, can some of you shout out some of your favorite things about Christmas, children and grown-ups? If there's awkward silence, responsible grown-ups, that's who I'm expecting you to contribute. Favorite things about Christmas, some of you guys on this side, maybe? Presents. That was Dad, I heard, uh, shout that out. Somebody over here shouted something. Was that you, Isla? Food. Excellent. Yes. Anything in particular? Pigs and blankets from the back. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Favorite thing about Christmas makes it so special? Girls, yes. Jesus. Great answer. And you know what? We're going to get to that. Brilliant. Anybody else? Family. Thank you. Guys at the back? Celebration of Jesus' birth. birth. Yet yeah, we're getting more specific. I like it. There were some people over here. Ewan, was that you something? Christmas tree. Love that. Great answer. Maybe some of the grown-ups. Anything? Favorite thing about Christmas? Cheese. Excellent answer. I can't have cheese. It makes me very sad. Over, over here I heard somebody. Say that. Snow. We're not blessed with snow on the East Coast, are we? But yes, snow is a brilliant thing about Christmas. I've put up some of my favorite things that make Christmas special on some slides. So, Isla, we're on the same wavelength, absolutely. That was my Christmas dinner two years ago. It was wonderful. What's next, Karis? Christmas parties. The Christmas Kayleys, Christmas quizzes, Secret Santa, that's the staff from a couple of years ago. That was so much fun. I love the Christmas parties. Uh, what else have we got, Karis? Now, see, this is an interesting one. For a town like ours, going home for Christmas, I really like that. That's, that's a couple of years ago, going back to, to Peru. It involved getting the plane for 11 hours, and then those pictures are just to remind myself of what I'm missing, 25 degrees heat in the southern hemisphere. But it's lovely. Going home for Christmas is one of the things that can make it so special. I think there's one more. Oh, yes, and family. And I think one of you girls, Catherine, I think you said family, absolutely. I just put up a bunch of pictures from Christmases throughout the years. Uh, it made me very emotional putting that together, actually. There are so many lovely things. Karis, get rid of that, please. Um, that make Christmas really special. But it could be easy for us to maybe overlook or, or forget what good news Christmas really is. Matthew, one of Jesus' friends, tells us super clearly why Christmas is truly special. He does that as he tells us who this baby born at Christmas is. In our reading, he used two unmistakable Old Testament references. I wonder, did you spot the two names that were used? That the baby is Emmanuel and he is Jesus. We've got the verse, verse 23 up there, and it's in your orders of service. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, and it takes us back to the book of Isaiah, written 700 years before Jesus' birth. In other words, Matthew is saying that over hundreds of years, there are promises from God building up, and they came true at that first Christmas. This baby is long promised, and he is no less than God himself. And this is just outrageous. The, the Bible's claim about Christmas the reason it's such good news is because God has come in the flesh, in person. Jesus isn't just a, a teacher or a healer or someone who feeds people, though he did do all of those things out of compassion. 
He is God with us. And that's the first thing that makes Christmas so special. I wonder if you'll remember that, that the first thing that makes Christmas so special is that God is with us, Emmanuel. Let's read verse 21, Karis. I think it will come up. It's in your order of service. And the other great name given to this long-promised child. Jesus wasn't a, a, an unusual name back in the first century. Let's read it. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means God saves, or God to the rescue. I think we can put it like that. And like before, this too is pointing back to a, a promise written hundreds and hundreds of years before in the Old Testament. It comes from a psalm, Psalm 103, and it says this, God will redeem Israel from all their sins. Isn't that really interesting? God promises that he will rescue from sin, and centuries later, Jesus comes to do it. This is actually God's long-promised rescuer, but it's a really specific rescue mission. Jesus came to save people from their sins. Uh, the problem uh, of sin, far from being irrelevant or, or down the pecking order uh, of real-world problems, it is our most urgent and most long-lasting problem we face. How can I say that when people are struggling to pay their bills or when there's a climate crisis and when war is still ongoing in Europe and in the Middle East. Sin is our most urgent and most long-lasting problem because if you try to fix it yourself, you'll discover you just can't. And sin is also our most urgent and long-lasting problem because the consequences of sin last not only in this life, but also into eternity. Uh, what does the Bible mean by sin? Well, the key to it is that letter right in the middle of the word. Sin puts I at the center of the universe. It says, God's not the boss, I am. I can do what I want, when I want, and no one has the right to say otherwise. And so, though God has made us and gives us everything good to enjoy, like all our favorite Christmas things, we don't give him thanks and don't listen to how he tells us how to live. We think we can run our lives our way. Uh, the problem is that that just doesn't work when everyone only looks out for themselves. I know myself, and all I need to do is play a couple of board games or live under the same roof with some of my family for a couple of days over Christmas to realize that human beings, we, we struggle to maintain the peace. Uh, I wonder if you can relate to that at all. Uh, living for me isn't the way we were made to be. It doesn't work. And the most serious consequence of sin, the Bible says, is that it ruins and ruptures our relationship with God. God who made us is perfectly loving and pure and good and just. And he's not just going to sit there endlessly ignoring how we treat him and how we treat each other. God will punish our sin, and so our biggest need is to be forgiven by God. That is why Jesus came 
that first Christmas, to rescue us from our sins and its consequences. Let me put it this way. I don't know if you've ever been rescued at sea. I haven't, but I want you to imagine for just one second that you are on a ship and it's sinking. Maybe you're already in the icy water, being shoved by the wind and the waves, struggling to stay afloat. All of a sudden, you see someone in one of these, headed in your direction. like clockwork. A lifeboat. How amazing to see a lifeboat. Oh, the relief. All you've got to do is get in the lifeboat to get to safety. (laughs) Scott assured me that it would be totally okay to do it with Hillary and not with a child. I said it'd be tricky, but he's proving me wrong except for that he just crashed Hillary into some chairs. (laughs) This lifeboat, this lifeline, is a picture of God's rescue. You're pulled on board, and you're saved from the sea that was about to swallow. Well done, you guys. Well done. (laughs) And the lifeboat survived. You're pulled on board. You're saved from the sea, which was about to swallow you up. And you know what? For Christians, we, we have been saved. The, the, the baby born on Christmas grew up and died on a cross on Easter. Uh, on the cross, Jesus took the punishment our sins deserved, and if we're trusting in Him, it's like we've been rescued from drowning. We're in the lifeboat, headed for the shore. That's that's the glorious hope of Christmas. God has provided a way entirely free, entirely of grace, as a gift Jesus has made it fully possible to be fully forgiven forever, for free. He came to rescue us from our sins. That's the the two big things, isn't it, that we've seen so far in this little passage. Christmas is truly special because God himself came to be with us and to rescue us from our sin. I think that's worth singing about. We've seen that the reason Christmas is truly special is because God came to be with us, Emmanuel, and he came to rescue us as a savior that, that first Christmas. Clearly, God cares about us. That's a, a big thing we learn at Christmas. But in our second reading that Amy just read for us, we learn a little bit more about the baby born on Christmas. And what we learn is that this baby seems to be very, very important because of the kind of visitors that come to see him. Wise men, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of wise men. They sound like clever people important people who have come to see Jesus. But but more importantly, did you notice what they called Jesus? They call him the King of the Jews, which is fascinating, isn't it? Because if you were paying attention to the reading and it's in front of you, there's another king in the story, Herod. They, They don't come to visit Herod, the king, they come to visit Jesus. It must be pretty cool to be the king or queen of a country. You're very important, and important people come to see you. It's pretty cool, right? 
Imagine one day some important people come to see you and they say, Hey, king, or hey, queen, we are here not to see you, but to see someone way more important than you, someone who's actually the king over you, the real king of your country. That's kind of what happens in the story we just read. And we're told that Herod didn't like this. He, he thought he was in charge. It seems that King Jesus is king of the Jews and that he is in charge. That makes Jesus more important than Herod. It makes Jesus a king of kings. But he's a king for, for everyone. Can anybody, if you were paying attention, can you tell me where the wise men came from? Anybody? Yeah, you and go for it. They come from the east. You're absolutely right. And this is really important. It means they haven't come from Israel or Judea or Bethlehem. They, they've come from another country. And these foreigners recognize that Jesus is their king. Matthew puts this true story as part of his account about Jesus to, to show us that Jesus isn't just the king of the Jews, but king over everyone. He's king over the whole world, king over everybody, everywhere. Why does this matter? Well, well, Christmas is so special because the one who came to save us and who cares for us is also the one who's in charge. Uh, the one who died on a cross wasn't a, a powerless victim, but the king with all the power. The, the one who really cares is also the one who's in charge. That's really good news. And it's really interesting to me that Matthew begins his gospel with people from other nations coming to Jesus. And right at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says to his followers, and this is super important, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Uh, that's why in St. Andrew's Free Church, we have people who have gone and go all over the world to tell others the good news about Jesus, precisely because people obeyed that command. Lots of us who live nowhere near the Middle East heard about the good news, about who Jesus is and that he came to rescue us from our sins. Look at the pictures that are going to come up on the screen. These are people from our church family and who represent countries from all over the world. We've got Scotland and Argentina. We've got the US. We've got Hong Kong, Macau. Did you know that Toto has a Portuguese passport? fascinating. I had no idea. We've got the Netherlands. We've got more Scotland. We've got the U.S., India. I put the hunters up there. They're from the U.S. They went as missionaries to Costa Rica. That's people going and taking the good news about Jesus all over the world. We've got Canada. Now, Adian was insistent that only England be mentioned when describing where he's from. I think he's far more multicultural than that, but England only. Uh, we've got the English in the bottom left corner. We've got the Welsh and the Northern Irish. This is very British, except for the Costa Ricans. Anyhow, um, Look at this picture as well. We've got more Americans. We've got South Africans. We've got Jamaica. We've got the Republic of Ireland. We've got Peru. Now, David Weeks was a missionary in, in Uganda. Look at all the countries of the world that the gospel has reached because Jesus is king over all the world and people obeyed their king's command. It's super encouraging to me to just see those pictures and know how represented the world is in this very room. And uh, for 2,000 years, people all around the world have heard about Jesus 
and concluded that he's definitely worth at least uh, a second look. I would take it a step further. If this is true, that Jesus is king over the whole world, then that means he's king over every one of us in this room. And how should we respond to this king who came to rescue? Well, in our passage, there's actually three responses. You might remember Herod, and it's there in in verse 3. We read that Herod was troubled. Later on, we're going to read that Herod was furious. He, He tried to kill Jesus. He said no to Jesus. He shut the door on Jesus' face. And what a tragic thing when Jesus came to meet our greatest need and rescue us. And then in in verses 4 to 6, you'll see that the, the chief priests and the scribes are mentioned. They were the people that were in charge of what was like the church of the day. And they're asked about where Jesus is, and they look it up in their Bibles, And they say what it says, but they don't go looking for Jesus. Uh, Later on, when they do encounter Jesus, they're just cold and indifferent to him. Like Herod, they say no. But but finally, we get the, the wise men in verses 10 and 11. And I wonder, look with me at those verses and what it says. Three things they do. I wonder if you noticed it. Firstly, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I'm going to read that again. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Where do you think that lands on the happy scale? If you're a a Christian, if you're trusting in Jesus, life might still be full uh, of mixed emotions. It might not be easy. But we do have a a joy that comes from knowing that we've been rescued, that we are safe on the lifeboat and headed to the shore. But we're we're told a couple other things that the the wise men do. They fell down and worshipped him, and then a little bit further down, then opening up their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Imagine giving Jesus your best, most favorite Christmas gift this Christmas day. What do you think? Pick your your favorite toy and you give it to Jesus. We don't have to do that. You don't have to give him your favorite toy. But rather, we do have to respond like the wise men. Matthew is telling us this is how you should respond to the king who came to rescue. By worshiping Jesus, by loving Jesus with your whole lives, by trusting him, by listening to his words and obeying them, by serving him and others with the gifts that we do have. That's what Matthew would say is the right response to the king who cares for you and who came to rescue you from your sins. That's a challenge even for Christians who love Jesus. In the busyness of Christmas, with all the inevitable mixed feelings of the season, are we stopping to worship and rightly respond to our king? Or does it all get lost in the noise? Uh, My final question for us all is, is what do you make of the real Christmas message? If you're here and if you're not a Christian, can I implore you to investigate it further? Far from being irrelevant, the birth of Jesus is the most significant event in all of human history. God's long-promised Savior, the King of the whole world, came to deal with our biggest problem. That's what makes Christmas so special, and I hope you'll have a chance to reflect on that a little bit further over the next coming weeks. We're going to sing our final carol, 
We're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. And as the band makes their way up, I'm going to invite you one last time to stand, if you're able, together and sing, O Come All Ye 